Jesus I am singing, He my song of joy will ever be. All the while He keeps my heart bells ringing, for His love is everything to me. He's my precious King, and though I dearly love Him, He's my Lord. We are in the book of Ecclesiastes. We are in the seventh chapter. If everything goes well, we will finish this chapter today. And I know that there's not a soul in here who believes that. But we are going to try. Ecclesiastes, the seventh chapter. In Ecclesiastes 7, verse 25... Uh, Solomon sums up what he uh, did during this particular time in his life. He says this, I applied my heart to know and to search and to seek out wisdom and the reason of things and to know the wickedness of folly, even of foolish and madness. Man, that right there might be the key verse of the book. Because that's what Solomon does. He says, I sought to find out, to understand, to know. And notice that he doesn't just seek out wisdom. He seeks out the other side of the coin as well, doesn't he? He says, I even seek to know the wickedness of folly, even of foolishness and madness. Because on the positive side of things, there are things to learn. And on the negative side of things, there are things to learn, aren't there? Okay, and so uh, uh, you can learn a lot about life from the good and the bad. And so uh, Solomon said, I applied my heart to know these things. It wasn't something that he just uh, hoped he would learn. It wasn't just something that he hoped others would learn and bring to him. He says, I was actively engaged in this process of learning. And... Um, some of the things that he learned are pretty interesting, aren't there? Question. Are there things worse than death? I got, a, I got a head nod and I got a, oh yes. Okay. In Ecclesiastes 7.26, listen to what Solomon says. And I find more bitter than death. Uh-oh. There's something worse than what? Something worse than death. I find more bitter than death the woman. Aren't you glad they didn't put a period there? <laughs> uh, now see, that would be bad, wouldn't it? He didn't put a period there, ladies, so you're, you're good. Okay. He didn't say that uh, the woman is more bitter than death, although some men may think that. <laughs> Ah, and I find more bitter than death the woman whose heart is snares and nets and her hands as bands. Whoso pleaseth God shall escape from her, but the sinner shall be taken by her. Man. Solomon said that he had found a woman who was more bitter than death. Mm. Isn't that something? That little word bitter. I looked up every lexicon that I had, and guess what the definition was? Bitter. And I thought, that ain't no definition. Okay, when you define a word by the word, you fail. Okay, so all the lexicons failed. So I looked up dictionary.com. Bitter, hard to bear, grievous, distressful, causing pain, piercing, stinging. True or false, death is a bitter pill to bear. It is, isn't it? Whether it's the death of a young person, whether it's the death of an old person, whether it's the death of someone we don't know, or whether it's the death of someone who is extremely close to us. Death is a bitter pill to swallow. But notice that Solomon says there is a woman who is more bitter than the enemy called death. Wow. Wow. Okay. You know, if I'd walked in this morning and I were to ask you, does a woman exist who is more bitter than death? How many of you would have said yes? Okay. How many of you would have said, well, that's me? Uh-huh. Now, see, 
That's a whole different ball game, isn't it? <laughs> I hope none of you are in here that are more bitter than death. That would be bad. He describes this woman, doesn't he? Whose heart is snares and what? And nets. Those are hunting and fishing terms, are they not? You put a snare up for an animal, you put a net out for a what? For a fish. I find it interesting in the Bible that they even hunted for birds using nets long ago. Isn't that interesting? Okay, that'd be that'd be fun process, wouldn't it? Trying to catch a bird with a net. Uh, but they had ways to do it. This woman is intent on entrapping a man. Okay, that, that's her purpose. That's what he's talking about here. A woman who is what? A woman whose heart is snares and nets. How do women trap men? Well, I wrote down a few things. Beautiful appearance. Usually that's enough for a guy, right? You know, it doesn't take much more than that. <laughs> Not for a guy. How about this? Kind words. Will that do it? The Bible sometimes talks about women whose lips drip with honey. Oh, see, Larry knows. Honey. <laughs> yes, women whose lips drip with honey. Okay? Very kind, gentle words that they throw out there. Very encouraging words. Um, they're flirtatious, aren't they? They can be uplifting. And all they have to do is to present a little side of neediness, right? Because you see, men like to be what? We don't use this word very often anymore. Chivalrous, don't we? We like to be those knights in shining armor. We like to be the one who swoops in and rescues the damsel in distress. And women know that. So they just present themselves as a little needy. And they know. Now think about that. You're pretty, right? You're kind. You're a little flirtatious, right? You don't tear the guy down. You build him up. Boy, you are a cutie. Or you are a hunk. It just it doesn't take much to, 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 to swoon a man, you know. You want to know the reason? Because every man walks out the door thinking that about himself already. And when a woman confirms that, he goes, Ooh, boy, I know. And then she's needy. Man, she seeks to do what? Entrap and snare a man. And there are some women out there who are good at it, aren't they? They are good at it. Yes, sir? That sort of describes Jezebel, doesn't it? <laughs> Yeah, and she even applied the makeup too. You know what? Yes, yeah, she she was uh, she was unbelievable. You don't you don't want to get near a Jezebel. That's for certain. Notice this: her hands are what? As bands. Her hands are as bands. The picture is that of a firm, warm embrace. So not only is she all these things. Apart from you, then what does she want to do? She wants to embrace you and hug you and just give you a good, warm embrace. She shows her affections as she draws the man close to her body. Man. Kind of scary when you picture it right, right? When you just read about it here, whose heart is as snares and nets and her hands as bands, you don't think much about it. But when you start understanding what Solomon means by those words, this is a dangerous woman. And he says, this woman is what? This woman is more bitter than what? Than death itself. In the book of Proverbs, Solomon often refers to this woman. And he refers to her as the strange woman. Man. Proverbs uh, 5 verse 20 says this, And why wilt thou, my son, be ravished with a strange woman and embrace the bosom of a stranger? Why? She is a prostitute. She is a harlot. She is an adulteress. She is a loose woman. Man. We, don't use, we just don't use words like that in society much anymore, do we? Isn't it funny how... 
bad words have been suppressed, you know, and we just don't talk about this stuff much anymore. Did we, did we used to talk about it when we were back in the 30s, 40s, and 50s? You guys know about that age, don't you? You know, you used to talk about those kind of, you know, uh, you'd see a woman and you'd say what? Well, don't, don't tell me, I don't want to know. But you'd know immediately, right, that there's a dangerous woman. Solomon wrote two types of men and their reactions to her. Okay? Whoso pleaseth God shall escape from her. So there's the first man. This man is aware of God's laws regarding sexual relationships and marriage. Instead of yielding to her enticements, he seeks to do what? Escape from the woman. But then there's another man, but the sinner shall be taken by her. The sinner, on the other hand, is lured by her advances. Proverbs 5.5 5 says that many that go into her fail to realize that her feet go down to death. Her steps take hold on hell. How many wives did Solomon have? 700 wives? And 300 concubines. I wonder how many he had to date till he found out, got enough of those, you know. He may have dated 30 or 40,000. What's that? <laughs> that was my point. <laughs> yeah. This is a man who knows whereby he speaks. Man, unbelievable. Ecclesiastes 7.27 Behold, this have I found. He's given another thing that he's found out, hasn't he? This have I found, saith the preacher, counting one by one to find out the account. Man. Behold, this I have found. I put the emphasis on the word I there. Again, Solomon was personally involved in this experiment. He didn't have others doing the work and just bringing the results to him. He was personally engaged. And like I said, one of these days, I want to sit down with old Solomon and I want to find out about this experiment, don't you? Even more than what he's revealed to us. Because over and over in the, in the text, he says, I did this, I did that, I applied my heart, I sought to know, I sought out. Man. Notice he says, counting one by one to find out the account. Solomon notes the meticulous nature of his investigation. Man. It was a count done how? One by one. Anybody ever done a difficult research project? Okay. And you know that there is a lot to study, okay? And there's a lot to read. And there are a lot of angles to the problem. Is it easy after you get started to start kind of saying, you know, I'm tired of this, it's difficult, and you just kind of start skipping over some things? Guess what Solomon didn't do? He didn't skip over anything. He said, I did what? I counted it. One by what? One by one, I counted it. Um, when I was an instructor at the Online Academy of Biblical Studies, there was a, another preacher there that taught uh, the Holy Spirit. And he made his students look up the word spirit in the whole Bible. Okay, every time the word spirit was used, and they had to make a determination, is God talking about Man's spirit? Or is he talking about the Holy Spirit? Man. Let me tell you something, folks. Get your, get, get your lexicon out. Get your strongs out tonight. And see how many times the word spirit is used in Scripture. That is a long study. You know it? A long study. And you got to do it one by one. Notice point B there. It was slow. It was laborious. It was intense. Good study always is. 
isn't it? Much study is weariness of the mind, Solomon writes. New King James, 765 references to the word spirit. That's New King James. Okay? It's probably not much different in the, uh, in the King James. Okay? Notice the effort, however, was intended to find out precise results. Solomon wanted no stone left unturned in the process. One of the benefits that the enemy has on us is that oftentimes we are lazy. Okay? We want easy, simple information, don't we? We don't want to study. We don't want to investigate. We don't want to research. We just want to hear one or two people and then that's truth. Okay? Guys, we should never be like that. Okay? We should be individuals who study, who research, who look into things and try to find as much evidence as we possibly can. Solomon certainly did. Does the Bible teach us to try and test things? Oh yes. 1 Thessalonians 5, 10 through, uh, that should be 12 there. Despise not prophesyings. Isn't that interesting? Despise not prophesyings. Now, he doesn't say which kind of prophesyings, does he? He just says, don't despise what? Don't despise prophesyings. Were there true prophets in the first century? Were there false prophets in the first century? Yes. Listen to, listen to Paul. Despise not prophesying. But he didn't stop there. Listen to what he says. Prove all things. Hold fast that which is good. Abstain from all appearance of what? Of evil. Don't despise the prophesying. Here's another problem we have in our society today. It's referred to as cancel culture, is it not? Okay. If you don't agree with me, and if you want to speak your opinion in opposition to me, then guess what I'm going to do to you? I'm going to shut you up. I'm going to forbid you to speak. I'm not going to let you speak. I'm going to do everything I can to make certain your opinion is not heard. Folks, that's not what God wants. Okay? God says what? Despise not prophesying. Let anybody talk. Let anybody prophesy. But then you do your homework. Prove all things. I've got the job of testing everything, researching everything. And the things that I find that are good, what does he say do? Hold fast to that which is good. The things that I find to be false, he says what? Abstain from all appearance of evil. That's my responsibility. 1 John 4, verse 1, Beloved, believe not every spirit, but try the spirits, whether they are of God. Because many false prophets are gone out into the world. You and I have the responsibility of trying the spirits. You don't just accept what somebody says because he's a nice person, or because he's an educated person, or because he's got a lot of money, or because he's in a powerful position. Who cares? What matters is truth, isn't it? That's what matters. You don't believe every spirit. You try the spirits, whether they're of God. Man. Notice point A there. As we try the spirits, we need to be meticulous in our investigation. When individuals get sloppy and lazy, they will omit important information that can radically change the conclusions, can't they? Isn't it easy just to quote John 3.16? For God so loved the world that He gave His only begotten Son that whosoever believeth in Him should have eternal life. There you go. All you got to do is what? Believe in Him. There's only about 13 million more Scripture in the Bible that you hadn't even looked at yet. Okay, But you see, you, can get, you get sloppy and you get lazy and just accept things. Folks, don't do that. Okay, Don't do that. Notice the note that I put down there. Some are just dishonest, aren't they? They know other evidence exists, but they refuse to include it because it will alter their conclusions. 
And I didn't put down an illustration in the spiritual world. I put down an illustration in the physical world today. Climate change activists refuse to include God in the equation, even though God upholds all things by the word of His power. Hebrews 1 verse 3. If climate change ceases to be such a big concern, then they have to give up much of their control of the population that they have taken. You see, the very, the very minute that somebody starts talking about climate, the end of the world, we're going to destroy ourselves, I ask them one question. Do you believe God exists? Well, yeah, I do. Well, you know what the Bible says about God? God says He's upholding all things by the word of His power. Let me ask you something. Do you think when God created this world that He knew one of these days man would be driving SUVs? He did. Ain't that amazing? He knew that. Uh, do you think He knew that we would have 8 billion people on the earth? Do you think He knew that we would be driving SUVs that use gas? I think he knew all that, didn't he? And you honestly think God is going to let this planet be destroyed by humans? Are you kidding me? The Bible says God's upholding the planet by the word of his power. Folks, this planet will be destroyed when God wants it destroyed, not by any of us in this room or in the entirety of the world. You're fooling yourself if you believe that's the case. See, the minute you inject God into that equation... Things are radically changed, are they not? Don't be a climate alarmist, guys. Um, I heard the other day that young people from the ages of about 18 to 35 have what they call climate anxiety. Okay? They sit around thinking that the earth is going to be destroyed before they get grown and get their families. You know what? I don't get up worry about that one iota. Do you? Now, I'm not a person who says destroy the climate, just destroy the earth. Pick up your trash, you know. Don't do stupid stuff, right? But guess what? I'm not worried about the earth coming to an end by 2035 or whatever. And, and I even got an electric lawnmower, so ha. Huh. <laughs> okay. And if I were to, if you were to ask me to buy one, would you buy another one? I say no. <laughs> if you ask me why, <laughs> you don't even want to know. You want to know the nicest thing about an electric mower? I don't have to worry about gas and oil. That's the nicest thing about an electric mower. You know the worst thing about an electric mower? It doesn't have the propulsion that a gas mower has. I have to go out after I've cut my grass and pick up leaves that my mower won't pick up because it doesn't have the suction underneath. It drives me insane. Uh, who, who had their hand raised? Rodney? I watched a video on Facebook. There's a man who was driving a truck. Yeah. And he was driving a No. No. <laughs> oh, man. You know, why don't they just put solar panels on those cars? You know? I, you've heard of wind propulsion? I've always thought about this, too. This is another experiment that I thought of. You know, a, a, a jet, when it's flying in the air, doesn't it go somewhere between four and 600 miles an hour? You know, if, you, if you're going through the, you know, yeah, use your gas to take off. When you get up to about 600 miles an hour, then just use the wind that's coming through to generate the power for the flight, right? I mean, you got wind power coming through, through your propellers, so just use the wind, turn off the engines, and fly along with wind power. I don't know. This is crazy stuff. Man, unbelievable. <laughs> 
unbelievable. Guys, my, my point, don't, don't worry about all this stuff. You know, put your faith in God, right? Put your faith in God. And see, it. and the other thing, is, the reason I use the illustration is, is that in, in many areas of life, people are not honest. Okay? They will not look at the facts. They will not look at all the research, all the evidence. And they form conclusions on some things that people say. And then ruin their lives. And ruin the lives of others over those conclusions. Okay? And the same thing can happen in your spiritual life, can it? A while ago we made mention of you know, John 3.16. There's a lot of other passages on salvation, aren't there? And uh, there's a lot more to do other than just believe. Belief is essential, but there's more to do than just that. Any other questions, comments? Well, we opened up a can of worms, didn't we? I did. Ecclesiastes 7, verse 28. Yet which my soul seeketh, but I find not. Now this is going to be an interesting text. Solomon's accounting involved questioning, Research, investigation, and study involving, watch this, many human beings. If you're going to find out the meaning of life, are you going to have to talk to a lot of people? Yeah. And Solomon did. You know, fortunately for Solomon, Solomon didn't have to go all over the world. He had a lot of people come to him just because of who he was. Individuals had heard about him. And so he sat down and he talked and he questioned and he listened to hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of individuals as he did his research. He was seeking people with a true purpose, was he not? Can you imagine? You, you bring somebody up and you ask them the question, what is the true purpose of life? I bet most people have never even stopped to think about what the true purpose of life is. Why am I really here on this earth? Okay, And so, when you present that question to them, can you get a multitude of answers? Oh, it'd be unbelievable how many answers you could get to that particular question. Okay? He was seeking those who understood why they were living on earth. And listen to what he says. Yet, my soul seeketh, but I find what? I find not. I wonder if we left this building and just started knocking on doors and asking people, i got one question for you. What is the real purpose of your life? I wonder how many houses, how many doors we'd have to knock, how many people we'd have to talk to till we finally find the person who has an answer to that question. Solomon says this, I found one man among a thousand. In fact, he puts it this way, one man among a thousand have I found. Can you imagine that? Is a thousand people a lot of people? Go out and try to talk to a thousand people today. He says, every thousandth person, I find the answer. Now watch this next statement. But a woman among all those have I not found. Man, that's even worse, isn't it? One man among a thousand have I found. Folks, men during this particular time in history were the leaders, were they not? Okay, they were the leaders. Men occupied the positions of leadership among the nation, and I mean all of them. They were the leaders of the home. They were the leaders of businesses. They were the leaders of kingdoms. They were the men in charge. Men, the elders, the men of the city, sat at the gates. If there was anybody who ought to know the answer to the question, who was it? Men. One in a thousand. One in a thousand. Oh yes, absolutely, the older ones. I want you to think about that. I just put down there, he only found a hundred men out of 100,000 people. It's not very many, is it? 
Every hundred thousand people he talked to, maybe I find a hundred who have a clue. Man, I bet you today that number's even less than that. Yes, ma'am. What was their? We don't know their answer, but it wasn't the right answer. Okay. Oh the, no, the hundred would give the right answer, and he's going to come to a conclusion. If you if you stick around long enough, we're going to get to the last chapter, and Solomon will tell us what the right answer is. Okay, so it, it, it'll be good. So I'm not telling you the answer so you'll keep coming back. We do that a lot in here, don't we? Yes. Now notice that next statement, and this troubles women probably. Gets them angry with Solomon. I wish Solomon were here. I'd tell him a thing or two. Okay. But a woman among all those have I not found. Well, there's a reason for that, folks. And the reason was because women of Solomon's day didn't hold positions of leadership for the most part. What was their responsibilities primarily? They were domestic, were they not? They were to take care of the home. Their, their lives were extremely, and you hate to put it this way, but extremely simple in nature for the most part. They had children. They took care of children. They took care of their husbands. That was their function. And if you were to ask them, what is your purpose in life? You want to know what most women would say? Take care of my family. Take care of my family. They didn't, they didn't have a purpose much beyond that. Let me ask you something, ladies. Is that your purpose in life, just to take care of your family? No. That's not why you're here. A man might say something like this. Well, I'm here to lead the nation. Well, you are leading the nation, and that's one of your purposes, but is that the true purpose of life? I'm here in order to amass massive wealth, in order for, to pass that on to my children. Well, that may be part of what you're doing, but is that the real purpose of life? Because Solomon says, you're going to leave all that wealth behind to children who probably don't give a squat about it, or who will take it and misuse it. So what good is that? The true purpose of life. I ask a question there. How many men and how many women today are living lives of purpose? Go to the beach and watch them today. You think they're living lives of purpose? You think folks who stayed home today and didn't go to worship services are living lives of purpose? Oh, they may think they are. But when they die, all those purposes are gone, aren't they? This is extremely sad since we have this wonderful book that reveals to man exactly what his purpose should be. Isn't it? Now think about that. Several thousand years ago, Solomon undertook this experiment to find out what man's purpose is. And he tells us in this book. And yet, we're living way after Solomon, have the book in our hands, and people still aren't living according to to the divine purpose. It's unbelievable, isn't it? Unbelievable. Ecclesiastes 7.29. We don't have enough time to get into it all, but listen to what he says. This only have I found, that God hath made man how? Upright. But they, talking about man, but they have sought out many inventions. I'm not going to go over this verse since the bell rang, but I want you to, I'm going to give you some homework that you won't do. <laughs> okay. I, I say that, you know, laughingly, but it's true because I'll come in next week and I'll ask how many did the homework and no hands will go up. Okay. Homework. Look up two words upright and invention. Inventions. God hath made man upright. But they have sought out many what? Inventions. Those are the two key words. See, Solomon said, what does Solomon say? Solomon says, one by one, I searched out things. I went one by one to different individuals, asking them what the true purpose of life is, right? And he says, I found maybe one in a thousand men and even fewer women. Who knew the answer to the question? He says, God made man how? Upright. But 
Man has sought out many inventions. So what in the world does he mean by all that? There's a lot in that passage, guys. We'll talk about it next week, and we will get into chapter 8. And you were right, we didn't finish chapter 7, which is not surprising. Y'all talk too much. <laughs> Thank y'all.